Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys, for joining us. Um, I am. Wait, is the video on? Oh, it's yeah. It is. Okay. Great. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I know we'll have some more people trickle in, and we have a great showing on Zoom as well. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ronald Magliola. He graduated from the Indiana University School of Medicine and is a member of the AOA Medical Honor Society. He's a graduate of the Metro Health MedPeds Residency Program, where he now serves as the program director since 2010. His primary clinical interests include medical, bariatric medicine, and neurodevelopmental disabilities. He is boarded in obesity medicine, as well as internal medicine and pediatrics, and he attends in the Metro Health Weight Management Clinic where he cares for adolescents and adults. He currently serves as the medical consultant to the Cuyahoga County Board of Developmental Disabilities. He is passionate about homeless health care and ensuring that residents have ample service learning opportunities. His scholarly work has focused on bolstering med peds recruitment nationwide and helping programs discover their mission, vision, values, and purpose. So without further ado, um, Dr. Magliola will present How Can We Be Both? The Hunger Obesity Par Paradox. Please join me in welcoming him. Alyssa, thank you very much. That was such a gracious introduction. Uh, thanks to Nate, the MedPeds program, and everyone here. It's it's really great to be back. I had a chance to um, bring Grand Rounds several years ago. I think I came with 90 slides, and we managed to finish in 60 minutes. I have far less slides, mm -hmm. and hopefully there'll be time for questions and uh, um, some discussion. So my interest in this topic is an intersection of some of the work that I already do in Cleveland. I'm really lucky to be able to work with patients uh, in my obesity clinic. Um, and I see a lot of patients of lower socioeconomic status. And I also have an interest in culinary medicine, maybe a junior historian. So I think that that's where a lot of this all comes. And it's been a topic that I've been interested in um, for quite some time. So this was an opportunity to put something together for you all. So some new content I'm pretty excited about. All right, so let's uh, advance here, got it. So I have nothing to disclose. I'm not gonna talk about anything off label. And in terms of today's objectives, there's three of them. And I hope you guys, when you, uh, when you leave here today, will be able to describe the resource scarcity hypothesis in the context of the hunger obesity paradox to analyze the impact of a threatened food supply on low socioeconomic status individuals and to recommend some interventions to address the food insecurity obesity paradox for both adults and children. The foundation of what I'm really talking about today started um, from a um, provocative case report um, by Dr. Dietz, um, who's a highly uh, regarded obesity researcher. And you probably have actually read some of his work if you've ever been through one of the obesity articles and up to date. In 1995, he described a 176 pound seven-year-old and he wrote that at least two possibilities could explain the association of hunger and obesity in the same patient. In this family, the increased fat content of food eaten to prevent hunger at times when the family lacked money to buy food represents the most likely reason for the association of obesity and hunger. An alternative possibility is that obesity may represent an adaptive response to episodic food insufficiency. So today we recognize that obesity is a chronic, relapsing, multifactorial disease that starts early in life and, uh, and childhood obesity is now a growing public health concern where prevention is critical. The relationship to obesity and food insecurity has of course been increasing worldwide. Weight gain of course happens when individuals ingest more energy than they expend. Adipose tissue is able to adapt against, uh, to prevent uh, 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 concerns or uh, uh, to defend against periods when food is less available. And consequently, the optimum level of body fat does rely on access to food. So let's start by defining food insecurity. And we start with the United States Department of Agriculture defines four levels of food insecurity. Now, most of the time, this is seen when our patients take uh, social health, the social determinant of health surveys. And so they will ask questions. Uh, they will ask questions about food insecurity or for food security by saying, do you have enough of the foods that you want to eat? And that is uh, as well as enough, but not always the kind of foods. And that follows under the category of relative food security, either high or marginal. Then you have the two categories or two questions that relate to food insecurity. Do you, have, do you sometimes not have enough foods to eat is one of the questions or one of the uh, possible answers. Or lastly, often not enough to eat. So sometimes not enough to eat is indicative or at least correlates with the USDA of low food security. 
Um, and then often not enough to eat is considered very low food security or even food insufficiency, generally accompanied by hunger, and importantly, a decrease in the number of available calories. The prevalence of food insecurity in the United States in, among households is about two, I'm sorry, about 10%, 10, 10.2%. This, of course, is slightly higher in a more urbanized area, such as Cleveland, where the service area that the Cleveland Food Bank uh, uh, services is a, a, has about one in seven individuals or one in seven families. Because I know this makes sense, but it's worth noting that there's no such thing as one or two members of a family being food insecure. It's the entire family goes together. And I think that's another part of this interest where this is truly a MedPeds topic. Now, over the last 25 plus years, the trend, believe it or not, of food insecurity status among the United, in the United States actually, I think, has been relatively stable, with one notable exception. We had the Great Recession of 2007 and 2009, and the TARP program, which was a federal government sort of bailout program, was largely focused on um, financial institutions. And when it was all said and done, the government, actually, the federal government actually made a profit of $109 billion dollars theoretically taken out of the system, despite the fact that many people, many real people, real families were in trouble. And I contrast that with the COVID-19 pandemic, where the outlays so far, and it's going to take us 10 years to figure out how much this costs, but so far the government has outlaid $4.2 trillion. And most of that has actually gone, a significant chunk has gone directly into the hands of people and families. And I think if you look at the graph, you see that it took about maybe eight to 10 years, almost a decade, from the Great Recession to return to the food security levels that we, that we saw before the uh, uh, Great Recession. So the association between food insecurity and obesity, at least in the US adults, particularly women, is well established. Adults who were food insecure in the 12 states that were uh, analyzed had a 32% increase in obesity after adjusting for socio-demographic characteristics. Those characteristics being things like age, sex, race, ethnicity, education level, household income, marital status, unemployment status, and the number of children in the household. This effect, as I, as I indicated here, has been seen in women, but not in men, and we will probe some of those reasons in a moment. This, of course, gives rise to two hypotheses, which are very similar to what Dr. Dietz described, to help explain this relationship. Both, unfortunately, are descriptive. They're not probative nor mechanistic in nature. So recall, for substantial weight gain to occur, there, there must be a greater, let me move this off. Here. Yeah, okay. great. Sorry about that. Thank you. I, uh, I read Nate's thoughts. Thank you. Awesome. So for substantial weight gain to occur, there must be a greater than, and there must be greater energy expenditure on a long-term basis. There's a physiologically regulated adaptable system that's actually designed to resist change. It's homeostasis, of course. Therefore, noting intake of energy high foods or reduced physical activity in low socioeconomic populations may document the critical parts of the mechanism, but neither represents the explanation. That would sort of be like saying that patients who have Prater Willi gain weight simply because they eat more calories than they take in. And we understand that that, that system is much more than just what I mentioned. So I think we need to begin to explain some of those mechanisms. And looking at energy uh, balance on this chart, I think the operative word I circled there is perceived. Perceived has connotation, right? It, it talks about the unpredictability potentially of chronic stress. And that's the chronic stress that may explain why some food insecure children and adolescents have poor diet quality than others. The chronic stress, of course, also activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which triggers a whole cascade of hormones leading to the eventual release of cortisol. Of course, I was gonna talk about cortisol at some point today. And that stimulates highly palatable food, basically delicious food, food that tends to be higher in fat and higher in sugar, which can then lead to excessive calorie intake. Now, given the abundance of access to unhealthy foods in low-income neighborhoods, some food insecure children and adults may eat as a coping strategy to the ongoing experience of chronic stress. So what have we actually observed since uh, Dr. Dietz's case study, again, in pediatrics in 1995? We've seen plenty of studies that have replicated that the food insecurity obesity paradox is typically present in women, but not men. We also see that it's present in children and adolescents, at least younger adolescents, but not younger adults. One example is the Hispanic Community Children's Study study of Latino health, uh, Latino youth from age eight to 16. 
In this study, there was a high prevalence of food insecurity, 46%, and that was associated with a higher mean BMI and depression scores than matched controls who were food secure. We also saw that weight was, weight was obtained, attributed sorry, to greater familial uh, acculturative stress, basically coming to the United States or uh, assimilating the cultures that we have here. Um, greater economic stress and a weakened family support compared to more food secure households. And finally, we saw that the lowest household income was associated with the highest BMI. This is particularly, I presented this particularly in, in, uh, uh, in light of the current refugee and immigration climate. So that is, we're seeing these patients come to Cleveland, we have some understanding of where they may be coming from. So overall, the mechanisms explaining the paradox are lacking. Researchers have uh, analyzed the issue using different individual and societal variables, but these studies have actually failed to explain mechanisms since they lack strength or are purely theoretical. This is because most studies have used cross-sectional models, analyzing data drawn from other research that was not necessarily intended to study the phenomenon of, of the obesity paradox. For instance, data from large national health surveys. So with that lack of empirical studies, the preeminent theory of resource scarcity has emerged. The resource scarcity hypothesis is, uh, has a basis in the observation that interventions that have focused on food and resources to reduce weight have ge generally fallen flat. For instance, when exercise facilities are made available to lower uh, socioeconomic status populations, they are often not utilized. Uh, in the second study, providing monetary resources or food uh, actually caused weight gain in a lower socioeconomic status population in rural Mexico. And finally, increasing food stamps at the time in 1999 and 2000, that's what we referred to the, 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 food, the Federal Food Assistance Program as, um, by $2,000 a year had no effect on the BMI disparities. So I think it's fair enough to uh, at least begin to probe what some of those root cause mechanisms or theories might be. And so here's, I'm gonna start by looking at maybe a surrogate for lower uh, socioeconomic status humans. And that would be, I guess, a low socioeconomic status rat. Now, how do we figure out who the dominant rat is and who the, uh, who the subordinate rat is? And it turns out the dominant rat is in, in these studies uh, loses is theoretically the quickest and loses the most body fat or body weight in these studies and also has the least number of scratch or bite marks. Kind of an interesting way of figuring out like who's the, the, the king in, uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the, the chamber. So again, um, I wanted to, uh, I, I have a, a, a picture of what the, uh, the visible burl chamber, chamber looks like. And in this study, the rats got to spend 14 days cohabitating kind of scratching at each other, figuring out who's the fastest, who lost the most amount of weight. Following each 14 day observation period or cohabitation period, the rats got to spend 21 days in their own personal paradise. They had an isolated recovery. And this was done twice in the study. Um, I showed the results at least for food intake during the recovery period. And what we saw was that the subordinate rats ate more food in both, in both of the recovery periods, which I've shown here. Um, I did not show you that the subordinate rats also increase fat, um, just out of just keeping some space there, but I can assure you that the, both things uh, fit this population. So let's look at some primates. So social rank in primates is a little bit easier to kind of figure out, um, and it probably influences energy balance, energy expenditure, and the thought that there may be some aspect of metabolic efficiency. And when we talk about metabolic efficiency, we talk about mitochondrial efficiency. This makes certain individuals basically just more efficient in life. They have a lower resting energy expenditure. When they go to perform any activities, they just don't expend the same amount of energy. And so here for primates, dominant and subordinate primates both preferred a high fat diet when given a choice, but the subordinate animals consumed more of a high fat diet, whereas the dominant animals did not consume the high fat diet in excess of what they needed for their energy requirements. They had a certain level of adaptability or homeostasis from a, from a dominant standpoint that the subordinates did not enjoy. And I promise we'll talk a little bit more about metabolic uh, uh, efficiency in a couple of slides. Similarly, among humans, lower education, lower employment grade, lower income are associated with poor diet quality that of course is higher in energy density. One example is a study uh, looking at 92 women, 90% were white, who were, self, who were able to self-report measures of subjective social status. Their uh, reports show, were significantly inversely related to 
items of, uh, on items of anxiety, pessimism, stress, and daytime ambulatory diastolic blood pressures after controlling for objective measurements. It certainly suggests that women with lower socioeconomic status showed less healthy dietary and uh, exercise behaviors that contributed to um, those, uh, those behaviors. One additional example I found I thought was uh, uh, maybe fit to our, uh, our, our football climate here in Cleveland uh, was illustrated by something as vicarious as the city's NFL team's victory or loss. So increased calorie consumption is observed in cities of losing football teams the day following the game compared to cities of winning teams or cities where, that did not play a game. And in fact, when researchers even asked patients about their losing football team and were given some snack choices, the, uh, the subjects ate an additional 80 calories during their interview if they came from a losing football team city. So there's a lot that I think we have are able to unpack here. Now returning, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the Browns are literally killing us. It was, it was more than just that, that cooler of Bud Light that wouldn't open. <laughs> Thank you. So returning to a metabolic efficiency explanation, we said lower resting and active activity and energy expenditure um, from far more efficient mitochondria within certain populations now may make certain individuals more, uh, more likely to gain weight. Resting metabolic rates can differ, may be expressed variably within the population and possibly by uh, gen genetics or origin. An, un un an unpredictable and threatened food supply in comparison to a predictable and secure food supply has an influence on body weight and body stores. And the effect may be pronounced in low social status animals, in particular female rats and subordinate birds. For instance, female rats subjected to a 5% energy restriction respond paradoxically by increasing fat stores. Also, experimentally manipulating uh, manipulation or having natural circumstance that threaten the perception of food security among birds who are about to hibernate tended to increase body fat in several species of the subordinate, uh, the subordinate uh, uh, subjects, but not the dominant subjects. In humans, there is evidence that low socioeconomic status individuals may be more susceptible to the perception of low food security. There's a desire for money, and that seems to correlate with the desire for calories and vice versa, and, and sorry, and vice versa. And that's true even when energy, when higher energy dense foods are available. There's a thought potentially that this could be a modern derivative of an evolved desire for food from our ancient ancestors that now has contributed to um, some desire to get ahead and some component of hedonic hunger. And when we talk about hedonic hunger, we refer to consumption of food uh, for pleasure uh, and not just to maintain energy homeostasis. So what is the correlation between individual weight change and household food security status? So here's data collected from the 1999, 2000, and 2001, 2002 NHANES collection periods. In panel A, we see that women in households that were marginally food insecure, it's in blue, um, and food insecure individuals with hunger in pink were significantly more likely to obese compared to women in households that were fully food insecure. In panel B, we see the weight gain of, the, of that time period. Women in households that were marginally food secure were significantly more likely to gain at least 10 pounds compared to women in households that were fully food secure. Now, men were also looked at um, but as I colored nothing, um, there was, uh, they were definitely more likely to be obese and to gain at least 10 pounds, but those effects were smaller in magnitude and, did, um, and, uh, and were insignificant for um, these specifications. So, and even though there's enough of the foods that we want to eat, um, that the, our, um, our, our social secure, I'm sorry, when there isn't enough foods to eat, it does change the makeup of, of what we eat and our trajectory, if, even in such a short period as one or two years. A different way to model this is to look at the underlying stress of living potentially in developing countries. And while there is a negative association between obesity and socioeconomic status in developed countries here, there is a positive association in developing countries. In essence, the opposite is, is true of what we see in the United States. This may place higher class individuals, for instance, of developing countries, those who have access to knowledge and understand where they are in the social strata, um, but, uh, um, but, are, but uh, they, they may be placed on a lower social scale, um, even to developed countries, but they understand where they are in their country. So on a global scale, 
those individuals are potentially relatively equal to a lower socioeconomic status person in the United States, but they understand where they are, and therefore they realize that, that, that they're really not necessarily in the best position. I think about this as the stressful environment in developing countries is hard for even the wealthy to escape. And again, maybe this is about the desire for money equals the desire for calories. So talking about sex hormones, um, we've discussed that this is a relationship between socioeconomic status and, and obesity was, was more consistent in women than it is in men. And one explanation may be the sex hormones and the, the role in reproduction. Sex has consistently been shown to modify the association between obesity and depression. Adequate levels of body fat play a critical, uh, highly critical role in successful reproduction for women, but a much more limited role for men. And it's certainly plausible that any physiologically regulated fattening response to low food security would be specific to women to ensure successful survival and reproduction. And in future slides on the role of sex hormones and the mechanistic link between low food, food uh, future studies, I should say, on the role of sex hormones in the mechanistic link between low food security and weight gain are definitely warranted. So probing a little bit further, the second part of the sex differences hypothesis is that some women may sacrifice their own nutrition resources to protect their children from hunger or malnutrition. Again, obesity, sorry, uh, malnutrition and obesity is a fam family disease. The prevalence of physiologic consequences of food insecurity, such as stress and depression, has been noted to be higher in women. I'm going to get back to cortisol because I can't ignore that anymore for this discussion. Um, low social status is associated with higher basal cortisol levels, lower cortisol reactivity to acute stress, and a lack of cortisol habituation. Chronically elevated cortisol levels may influence both food intake and fat mechanism. This may be indicative of a higher allostatic load in stressed out individuals and a resulting dysregulation of the stress response. Allostatic load really is basically the wear and tear on the body. It's uh, an accumulated burden of chronic stress from life events. It involves really interaction of multiple different physiologic systems at varying degrees of activity. And it can help describe some of the environmental and uh, mental health challenges um, that, our that our patients face and when their resilience overwhelms that, those challenges, an allostatic overload can ensue. Cortisol has effects, of course, both on the hypothalamus as well as visceral fat. Uh, the hypothalamic effects of cortisol uh, can be seen when we uh, provide glucocorticoid administration uh, 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 which in men, which caused a higher food intake. And we see that the cortisol uh, metabolism is involved in regulating food choice and food intake. There's also a visceral fat effect where higher density of, rece of receptors, of cortisol receptors in the fat uh, is present than in other fat areas. High cortisol reactivity is associated with abdominal obesity. Cor uh, chronically high cortisol levels lead to insulin resistance and high levels of insulin resistance interact with cortisol to promote fat deposition and reduce lipolysis, making it harder, of course, to lose weight. Secretion of, of an orexogenic, which is an appetite uh, stimulating uh, hormone, uh, can occur uh, after chronically elevated cortisol levels um, react with the HPA axis um, to cause an inhibition of cositropin releasing hormone and eventually a, 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 an increase in neuropeptide Y, which further um, uh, prevents um, weight loss. So I want to take a moment to look at the, some of the supplemental nutrition assistance programs. Historically, these were not necessarily created to support healthy, and I emphasize healthy eating patterns, um, but with, uh, at least in 2018, 17% of Cuyahoga County residents receiving some type of federal uh, nutrition assistance, it's, I think, worth looking at to see if there's any, uh, any connection or any relationship between low food security, federal food assistance programs, and uh, um, weight gain. And so among 400, uh, sorry, 4,431 women and children in a WIC program, there was a 38% increase in overweight for those families who had mild or moderate food foods, uh, insecurity, but not food insufficiency. Of course, because by the time you get to food insufficiency, now you're so far uh, low on, on calories that um, that correlation is likely to not be observed. Thus, it appears that improved access to reasonably healthy food, and I emphasize reasonably, 
uh, through assistance programs is not sufficient to reduce energy intake and obesity. And in fact, greater access to food may actually increase fat stores. Together, these findings suggest that increased energy intake may be a fundamental response to threats to food insecurity that is dependent on the actual food supply uh, in low socioeconomic status individuals. SNAP's impact on increasing weight has been consistent, has, has not, sorry, has not been consistent in other studies. So in all fairness, I don't want you to take away that all SNAP programs result in, in weight gain. Um, this can vary by other aspects of the food environment, uh, such as food prices, staple foods, what foods are available in the community, other resources, um, which again, I think adds to another layer of the paradox. Of course, more research is needed, especially pilot studies that can explore ways to improve the quality of foods purchased with SNAP. So thinking about a few special populations and starting with children, a systemic, uh, sorry, systematic review of 16 uh, studies of child data show that among low-income households with children, food insecure kitchens were often stocked with more obesity promoting food, such as microwavable and quick frozen foods. Food insecure children may consume less fresh fruit than their peers, but this was not conclusive that their diet quality overall was lower that had been demonstrated for adults. Some studies have also noted a relationship between food insecurity and diet quality, but this was also, uh, sorry, only in adolescents. And finally, adults, and I emphasize generally women in food insecures protect their children, particularly younger ones from, comprom uh, from a compromised household dietary quality. There very much is a, a nurturing component for our, our mothers that doesn't necessarily apply to fathers or males in the in, uh, uh, adults, uh, adult males in the household. When we think about older adults, we see increased amplification of the risks of food insecurity resulting in sarcopenia. Sarcopenia literally is Greek for poverty of flesh. And so with increased fat mass and a decreased fat free mass, that can lead to poor health outcomes, which is amplified in our older population. And we'll see that compared to individuals of the, uh, that are matched of the same age, same weight, but the, those other individuals have a, are, not, are not sarcopenic and have more muscle mass and less fat mass. So I had to bring up the COVID-19 pandemic as another special population. And I think a really unique time, a unique period for us to study. Um, for at least the first year of the pandemic from March 13, 2020 to March 18, 2021, we saw a very significant uh, increase in obesity prevalence, far more than what would have been predicted in one, in one year. Uh, but to illustrate the multifactorial nature of, of this whole system, um, there, were other, there were four other obesity-related behaviors that illustrated um, some both improvements as well as um, some, uh, some uh, degrading of, the, uh, of the, the quality of things that lead to obesity. Making sure you guys can see that. Um, um, the, there was an increase in the, uh, the respondents that said that a 4.4% increase in the respondents said that they said that had uh, physical activity in the last month. There was a 1.5% increase in average sleep hours in a 24-hour period. Um, so theoretically, those were positive, uh, sorry, uh, in terms of helping um, with uh, obesity. And ones that were negative in terms of helping with obesity, uh, whereas a 2.7 increase in uh, uh, pa the past month of alcohol that was consumed and a, um, a, a negative 4% uh, or 4% decrease in those who had smoked uh, cigarettes some days or every day. So to summarize the resources scarcity hypothesis, if fat gain is a physiologically regulated strategic response to low food security to ensure survival and replication, interventions focused on food and resource uh, appear to be insignificant. And there are numerous examples in the literature of interventions that failed to produce weight loss among study participants. So to explore this further, we need to develop new studies and larger data sets to quantify and treat potential physiological mechanisms throughout the life course that links food security and social status with weight gain. This is just a quick overview of the system. I broke it into two slides that shows how complex this entire system might be. And I highlighted the, the, those pink or more gray looking areas here um, to, uh, to just show things that we just scratched the surface, surface of during this talk. Um, so a lot of the mechanisms that um, lead to weight gain, but there's also, and I'm gonna flip to the next slide, there's also plenty of opportunity, uh, spaces, locations, things that we can do to help attenuate that weight gain. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, for uh, future directions here um, to, uh, to, uh, to study and to make impacts in our, in our patients. 
Now, one, I think, very interesting bright spot came from an, inter inter an intervention by the U.S. Uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development. And this comes from the 1990s. It's an intervention known as the Moving to Opportunity Study. And in this, in this intervention, 4,600 very low-income families that came from areas um, where poverty concentration was greater than 40% were given the option to move to a, um, a higher-income neighborhood. This study uh, uh, took place in five U.S. cities, including Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City. There was no focus whatsoever on nutrition or physical activity. And an interim report um, details the following. Improvements in living conditions led to significant gains in mental health among adults in the experimental group. The levels of psychological uh, distress and depression were substantially reduced in this group. In addition, adults in both the experimental and section eight, which was a housing choice voucher, uh, experienced substantial reductions in obesity for reasons we do, we do not understand. This study demonstrates that randomizing families to move to a higher class neighborhood even without changing their income, their education, their occupation was sufficient to reduce obesity, depression, and diabetes. The potential of the moving to opportunity interventions show that social position independent of access to material resources influence susceptibility of low socioeconomic status individuals to weight gain. In adolescents, in adolescent comparisons across 35 countries, it turned out that actually income inequality better explained the inequities in overweight rather than the absolute wealth. It certainly helps to illustrate the devastating effects of social position and income equality, but not necessarily wealth. And I want to point out one final resource scarcity, and that is just other people. There's an increased risk of premature death from all causes among patients who identify as being lonely. Now, this is not about how many friends you have or are nearby. Loneliness is defined as the feeling of being alone, regardless, again, of the amount of social contact that you have. Social isolation and loneliness increases all-cause mortality by, um, I, I think it's 30%, including a 29% increased risk of heart disease and a 32% increased risk of stroke. Think about loneliness as fertilizer for other diseases. The biology of loneliness can accelerate the buildup of plaques and arteries, help the brain, um, uh, sorry, help cancer cells grow and promote inflammation in the brain that leads to a 50% greater risk of Alzheimer's disease. Lows, loneliness promotes several different types of wear and tear on the body, again, adding to the allostatic load. And in 2013, um, Vivek Murthy, the US Surgeon General declared loneliness and isolation as an epidemic, stating that social disconnection is common and more devastating than many of us realize. I guess we were exiting the pandemic and we needed a new epidemic to take its place. Nonetheless, this, uh, um, th there's significant um, uh, resource. I I I'd like to offer that there's a sig significant impact of the resource of scarcity of people. So I'm gonna shift gears. Now we get to talk about what providers can do. And I hope you get a chance to take away something that you guys can use in your clinic structures and, and, and whatnot. This is the work that I get a chance to do um, uh, every day in my clinics. And I want to talk uh, start off by talking about culinary medicine. And functionally, culinary medicine is the very practical part of eating. It explores the link between the food we eat and our health. It's a true blend of nutrition, science, traditional uh, medical, clinical knowledge, and the culinary arts. It's, to me, really about talking to people about food as a whole and not simply having them read the nutrition facts label. It gives the chance for me and our my clients to really talk, think about food and how does it taste and what does it look like? And it gives us a chance to talk about the joy of food and the culture of food. It's kind of what's on their plates, it's what's on their minds, and it's a real, real pleasure to be able to bring to light. So culinary medicine is really about the joy of food, which you all know is universal. It brings um, an evidence base about the role that food plays for health in an interprofessional expertise model uh, and brings that to the table, literally. It gives learners the tools they need to improve their relationship with food. And if, um, if that learner is a clinician, be able to provide education and increase competency around food. And we have options here at Case for any students. Uh, the Mandel Wellness pa uh, uh, path Pathway is an awesome resource. There's a new uh, uh, kitchen classroom that was opened earlier this year. Um, and so there's lots of options um, to get involved in culinary medicine. And I think our patients actually want us to know things about food and about cooking. And so feel free to talk to people about that kind of thing. 
So I have this um, section, I always think about how can we do this, whatever this is. And I wanna start by thinking about promoting consistent food. I wanna, I wanna offer that you should talk to your patients about reducing that income cycle of expensive food restaurants, uh, expensive food in restaurants at the beginning of a pay period. So at the beginning of the month, which then leads to declining food quality and possibly even food insufficiency at the end of the month, right before the next pay period. We need to get our patients talking about this so that they kind of think about, I wanna have money for food at the end of the month for restaurants and higher, and higher quality, potentially more expensive food at the end of the month. Of course, empathetic listening. You know, just us being there, it makes a big deal. And I think one of the goals going into the exam room when you're working with patients and uh, that involve any of the social determinants of health, any um, uh, health outcomes that can be readily tied um, to behavioral changes, you want the patient to leap off the exam table and say, that's it, doctor, you get me. And so I want you to always be thinking, how do I make sure I'm connecting with that person? And are they close to leaping off the exam table and actually saying, even though we just met 12 minutes ago, you totally get me. And so I think about counseling as the intervention. It goes a long way. Ask your patients about their stresses. Ask your patients about their struggles. Next, our, understand that change is difficult. Patients often seek quick fixes. The quicker the weight loss though, the less likely it is to be sustainable. I often challenge our patients when they come back second visit, third visit, and they say I've only lost four pounds. And I think about how fast that weight went on. There's no way it went on two or three pounds a week indefinitely. So get patients to reframe um, the context, have them redefine success, define success for themselves, be realistic. And um, no matter, I honestly, no matter what you do, especially when you warn patients, they will come back and say, I'm still not losing, I'm not losing as fast as I was supposed to, what's wrong? And the answer is nothing. Um, of course, I wanted to bring up a little something about motivational interviewing. And this is where we can get our patients to articulate their goals and to help them build some of their own discrepancy uh, between those goals, where they are now and where those goals are. So one of my very first questions when I have a patient in weight clinic, I say, I'd love to hear about um, when you lose weight and keep your weight off, how will your life be better? And they begin to articulate. They tell me about the pains, this kind of thing, what they can do with their kids, their grandkids, this, that, and the other. And those are things that I put in the chart and I can revisit those things because we need to be able to develop the discrepancy of I'm here now, you know, this is, that action is not getting me there or it's getting me, it's getting me closer to that where I wanna be. And finally, I, I talk about rolling with resistance because so much of the change that happens is in between the visit. I'm not willing to go home with the patient and make those changes, but we sure as heck can talk about them in the visit. And that's actually a really powerful thing. Um, we also need as clinicians to dismantle any, any worry that if we haven't made the change in that 15, 20 or 30 minute visit, that there's something wrong with us or the encounter. No, most change happens at home. It's just our job to plant the seed, let the patients define again, success for them and take it away from that point. We also need to help our patients understand that food is personal. It touches so much of what we are. It's a very universal experience. I say birthday and you guys are thinking of birthday cake almost immediately, right? So, uh, but for those, those things where we don't understand necessarily some of their celebrations, it is our responsibility to understand their ethnic staple foods. People express love with food. I'm often asked what to do with a certain family member, typically a, an Italian grandmother. She's pictured here. And so we have a conversation about the love of food and how you don't want to disappoint her, that she's expressing love through that food and how you have the opportunity to kind of say, hey, grandma, I really appreciate what you're doing, but I want to, I want to kind of bring you into a conversation where maybe we can think about some healthier foods. Maybe there's things where you can teach me how to make your food. You know, there's other ways of making sure that you're not upsetting grandma um, and hopefully in the process, getting her to make uh, negotiating so that she makes a few less meatballs. <laughs> I also think about exploring those hidden strengths. Caregivers, no matter want a healthy family. Our patients, and I illustrated some examples, particularly our mothers, are super awesome role models. And so make a note of that, um, that if, you know, I always think about a mom, a dad as being a strength, and that can help push change uh, to into fruition. I talk to patients about it's far better if you look at it overall for you to take your family to the park and burn 100 calories than it is for you to get on your elliptical and burn 500 calories in your basement by yourself. You're not going to imprint, imprint those healthy behaviors onto your kids. 
They're not going to expect it. They're not going to give it back to you when you forget to take them to the park. And so you have a lot of, you have a way of building in some extra strength within the family that can't happen in the office, but it, you can talk about it and you get people to articulate that and they'll go home and, and, and just do things differently. Um, I think there's gold everywhere. Um, and I, I, I maybe tongue in cheek, you know, say, think like a rich person, or at least that's kind of where I'm at. And I'm not sure what I'm going to, the example I'm going to give you is a, what a rich person would do, but it, it does fit to me. The gold is everywhere uh, uh, hypothesis. So I had a patient recently who calculated, and I think a rich person would, would calculate their water bill and their heat bill. And she said, you know, I'm spending 10 bucks a month every, I'm spending 10 bucks on showers every month. And then she realized she'd go to Planet Fitness and get a $10 membership and take a shower there. And she told me she goes to Planet Fitness, she pays 10 bucks for showers and gets a free gym out of the deal. And I thought, <laughs> that's a really great way of finding gold everywhere. Thank you for letting me share that. Um, also, help your patients find and reduce expenses. Money that they spend one place is money that they, or they, is money they can't spend other places. Uh, we talk about subscriptions, TV, internet, phone. I think about free being the best price. And instead of saying, I can't afford it, ask them, how can you afford that? Plan ahead. Communicate with the household. Dem democratize the decisions that the household makes. And this can be done at age-appropriate levels. So if you're thinking about toddlers, potentially, we give them two choices, right? If we want them to eat healthy, do you want broccoli or cauliflower? And they say pizza. Eventually, we take their choices away. We say, you know what? At least that time. But guess what? Next time you get a chance, you know, next time this comes up, you, you get the same choice. And we can push them in the right direction. And so by having that conversation among all the family members, everybody can be on the same page. And we talk a lot about the strategies. And I always think about this is what I'm hoping, you know, I want to talk about how we can build a healthier uh, food uh, environment for our family. This is what I want. This is what I need. And then let every family member express what they want and what they need. This is to me an opportunity to bring up some, some really good conversations within the family. And then again, gain the financial knowledge about the product. Someone says, I can't afford this. Have them look at that and really try to figure out, you know, what would it take to afford those kind of things? The other thing is we need to help Patients manage themselves. Patients don't think about managing others, right? You guys all have bosses. You are working to figure out how to manage your boss. Since Nate's here, the MedPeds residents are trying to figure out how can I manage Nate potentially to get what I need to accomplish out of the residency program. I want to make the residency program better, but his vision might not be exactly mine. So what can I do to get in his head and make things a little bit better? And so I think about this as giving our patients those management skills to organize, advocate, and get others on board. Get healthy eating in the workplace. Speak up about the cafeteria options. Adjust what gets stocked in the vending machine, which by the way, I don't like. I tell patients that's your employer charging you to come to work. And then they get mad and they say, I'm not gonna use the vending machine anymore, which is great. But just in case, let's change what's in it. Challenge all the previous ways of thinking. Be a contrarian. And I, I think about the question I ask is, can you imagine a healthy Friday, family, uh, Friday night fun activity with your family? Um, and then for patients potentially on going on vacation, the travel season. So reimagine those travels and hotels. How would it feel if you returned from vacation a little healthier than you left? How would you plan for that? Bring a cooler, find an Airbnb, stay in a place with a, a, you know, a kitchen, things like that. And then um, asking apartment managers about planting a vegetable garden. Now, in some areas of the city, there might need to be soil testing for heavy metals, but it's still worth asking. And, um, and, it, and you may even be able to um, again, if you're using your influence, you may even get the, the city um, to pay for that. And then I, I have this allowance track, and it's triggered when a patient states that their children shouldn't have to suffer with them, right? And so they'll say, well, my kids, they deserve this junk food or whatnot. And so my allowance trick is I, I say, you know, I don't know how you feel about allowances in your family, but let's face it, you're probably going to spend the money anyways. And so rewarding the kids for a behavior cleaning their room, taking out the trash can result in you giving them the money potentially to buy that item. Then they get to go to the store with you. They learn some of the value of the money. If it's $4 for a bag of Doritos, they get a chance to see what that is and how much work they put into that. And then I ask the patient, now that your kid has paid that $4 of their hard-earned money and the Doritos are sitting in the, in, the, in, the, in the cabinet, in the pantry, how likely are you to steal the food from your own kid? And the answer is, I'm not. And so that's a little bit of my allowance trick. Adapt it if you wish. Um, I also think about 
we have to have our patients understand what they're really paying for. We talked a little bit about those subscriptions, but diet fads are expensive. When someone's buying new stuff every month or every other month, I've had people come with wearing multiple patches and a whole bag of things they bought on TV. Um, and so I just get really worried. And, uh, you know, this is a thing we, we have to protect our patients against the highly influential person that's literally screaming into the, into the TV that you need to buy their, their product. The other thing, of course, is that nutrient dense foods like fresh fruits and vegetables often have a high per calorie cost compared to calorie dense junk foods. Uh, we see that those calorie dense foods that are low in nutritional value often seem, seem to be cost effective uh, staples for keeping a low income household fed. But I turn this into the reframing this as thinking into dollar, a fullness per dollar. So I would went over to Steel Yard last a couple of weeks ago, and I, I saw the head of cauliflower for three dollars and twenty four cents. That probably is going to get someone as full or more full than the, the bag of Doritos that costs more. This is tough. Change is hard. And making change is, is I'm convinced, the part that's very expensive. And I want to, you know, get, you know, kind of get that, that question about when patients ask me, isn't healthy eating expensive? And of course it can be, especially if you don't have the knowledge to go along with it. So I hate to pick on Heinen's, but patients come and say, if I'm going to get stuck eating cauliflower, I want the best cauliflower in Cleveland. And <laughs> everybody knows you go to Heinen's to get the best cauliflower mm -hmm. in Cleveland. And I think, how much you spend for it? Okay. We say, you know, I bet you get pretty good cauliflower at the farmer's market. They come back and say, yeah, it was a little cheaper at the farmer's market. Then eventually they wind up at Aldi. They wind up in the frozen fruit section and they realize it's about the same cauliflower and it's much cheaper. So making that, uh, the, the change can be quite expensive. And finally, the tyranny of choice. Um, I mentioned the tyranny of all the products out there, but we have the tyranny of, of diets. And if you're just, if you need something, the Mediterranean diet has been by far the most studied, the most efficacious. It has great results for cardiovascular um, uh, fitness. Um, and, and I think that's the one that we should be recommending to patients. It's been studied in observational uh, and epidemiological studies, and it's just far superior to other diets. So if you don't know what to do, get yourself familiar with the Mediterranean diet and begin to recommend off of that. Um, a thing that I kind of alluded to, but I really want to reiterate this, is that frozen vegetables are fresh vegetables. They were fresh right off the farm at some point, and somebody put them in a bag and chilled them. It doesn't make them not fresh vegetables anymore. Okay, patients kind of come with this notion that, again, they have to have fresh vegetables that don't last as long in the crisper, things like that. Um, I mentioned any money, any money saved somewhere is money saved everywhere. Um, and then we want even in the office, I help and I encourage you to help your clients um, uh, gain control over access to their own food supply, gardening, financial planning, strategic buying, such as buying in bulk. And um, as a residency program director, I usually fear the unfiltered posts that I read on Reddit, especially about my program. But here's an example of Reddit uh, is available to, uh, I saw over 600 ideas under being frugal. This, uh, this thread about cutting food costs and stopping hunger pains. So in the help your patients extract value, give patients the tools to understand food costs. Restaurants are at 20 to 30% of food costs um, so that every dollar that you give them, they're giving you 20 or 30 cents back in food. That is in comparison to grocery stores where the food cost is 99% in the main aisles. It's, it is, it really stinks. It's really hard to be a grocer. It's 60% of the bakery. Um, and then get patients in tune with the delivery cost of Uber Eats and DoorDash. It's pretty amazing. Take advantage of a food for life programs. Um, uh, the, 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 the food for market, uh, all the major institutions and towns have something similar. So uh, if you're able to and, and have access to this, uh, refer patients to these things. I mentioned free is the best price. So there's plenty of uh, online fitness apps. Pop Sugar, one word, fitness is one of those. Um, in particular, the Pop Sugar Fitness has exercises for a lot of body types. They will have the, you know, the, the, the regular exercise, they'll have an advanced, and then they'll have a low, a low impact version in most of their videos. And Fit On is, is a similar program. Um, and then group sharing of ideas. Um, this is uh, uh, to build social awareness, to build empowerment, to cut down on loneliness. And so um, at Metro, we have a one-year program that it's our version of the diabetes prevention uh, program. And then I think help our patients be aware of the risk of loneliness. For us and our social determinants of health, social isolation uh, was the, the top uh, concern of, social, of the social determinants of health among our patients at Metro. 47% were screened to be at high risk of social isolation. Get our patients acclimated or reacclimated with volunteer organiza or organizations. Um, 
get reacclimated with family that they've lost touch with or estranged from, get acclimated with faith communities, anyone that can help bring them into the foray. And then we have a Calls for Hope. It's a pilot program where basically the patients who screen at high risk for social isolation, um, we're, we put them in touch with volunteers who call them once a week, and they just do small talk about weather, hobbies, whatever they want to talk about. So it's just a, a way to reach out, and there's plenty of faith communities in Cleveland that are willing to partner. So in summary, we're, we're the providers of the 21st century epidemic of obesity. We need probative and mechanistic studies to examine the relationship between low food security, lower socioeconomic status, stress, and obesity. We need to know about food. We need to know about empowerment and healthy eating and helping patients navigate all the complexity of food insecurity so that they can be their best. For future research, um, I think about social uh, interventions aimed at reducing the perceived threat of low food security that is critical in changing energy intake behaviors. I think about determining the physiologic mechanisms that I briefly alluded to uh, for uh, both sensing a threat to low food security and being able to respond to it. And finally, to understand all the environmental and social factors that can trigger the food, uh, food scarcity uh, perception. So I thank you so much. It was really great to be able to talk to you today, and I would be very happy to take any questions. Hi, uh, thanks a lot. I'm back. I'm one of the pediatric team presidents. Um, I one of the things that I, I struggle a lot with is kind of the feeling that we're up against uh, a pretty well-regulated army of people who, you know, have designed who have essentially hijacks the satiety kind of, you know. Potato chip is just the right hit of um, prompting you to eat another potato chip without ever actually filling you up. You know, and, and I have conversations with, you know, parents who are giving the kids juice and adolescents who, you know, the, you know, I, I've tried a few different avenues. Like, juice is basically kids soda pop. Like, it's there's no nutritional value in it. It's all sugar. And for the adolescents, I'm like, hey, they're you're paying them to do long term damage to your body. Now, the individual how that works, but. I, do you, I mean, do you have any thoughts on yeah. how we kind of fight you? Yeah, no, this is good. Um, first off, dopamine is powerful, as you are describing. And um, I think the all, fundamentally, we have uh, we have a reliance on the food industry, right? We, we can't, we, 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 we will die without them. Um, and then when we ask for healthier foods, and I'm not necessarily trying to defend them, but I'm trying to like start to frame this. When we ask for healthy foods, we don't buy their foods. And then they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders to take or to add the more, add the salt back and add the sugar back. Um, I think this is part of a much like longer, like longer term evolution of the process. And we have data that shows the, like take the impulse aisle at the grocery store, People would say no one would buy fresh fruit there, but when we switch that up, and so that to me is the medium term, or the sorry, the, the medium size, because you're dealing with individuals, which is great. And I think you're doing a great job of it from what you described. And I think taking on the multinational uh, corporation is going to be tough, but somewhere in the middle is probably where the sweet spot is. The soda tax of Philadelphia made a really, really big deal. Okay. Like, I mean, it, it was like $4 for a 12 pack uh, extra of cans, a 12 pack of cans it changed uh, beverage consumption in enormously. And so they didn't have to take on the multinational corporations, deal with hedonic eating, um, dopamine. They just kind of hit people in the wallet in, the, you know, in another way. But I love that you're educating your patients directly about the food and using some analogies. And I think that that's very, very effective to getting to at least opening up people's eyes to uh, what's going in their body. 